Ten years ago, the story began on the normally quiet roads of Australia's island state. <laughs> World champions Hull and Brabham. A good day for Peter Brock in the classic competition. And uh, if at all possible, we won't be back next year for sure. Their third modern victory in a row. That's the king of target tells me. Well, how do we stop it? Water over the engine Madigi down. and Taylor have won. <laughs> to achieve the win they so desperately pursued, a decade has passed. The legend grows. Target Tasmania has come of age. to be driven with a bit of attitude. They've been a thrill in charging around on open roads. Sort of got the taste for it a little bit. This event is... Uh, you know, arguably the best event in the country and to some, one of the best events in the world. A coup for Tiger Tasmania today with the announcement motorcycle ace and Mick Doohan will run in this year's event. The five-time world champ making his four-wheel debut on the roads of Targa. It is a different, uh, a different race altogether for me. I really don't know what to expect, so, uh, so when you don't know what to expect, it's hard to get nervous. I've raced sort of pretty much all my life, so it's just another part of the event, really, and uh, really looking forward to it more than being too worried about it because we're here. We, no, it doesn't do any good to start worrying about it, but uh, we're a bit excited about it more than anything else. Michael Dewey will have control of the Mercedes CLK 55 AMG. With its eight cylinder, 347 horsepower engine, the bends will go from 0 to 100 in 5.4 seconds. I drive uh, these type of cars quite frequently and um, occasionally do drive days for Mercedes Benz and AMG, um, both here in Australia and in Europe. So uh, on, on a circuit, but uh, a little bit different than this car. This car's a little bit better set up for the racetrack, so I'm really looking forward to this. And it, it is a different environment as far as I'm not racing a motorcycle, I'm in a car. Go. There's no pressure. <laughs> Everything else I've ever done, the first time out has been wet, so... Exactly. <laughs> also returning for his second attempt at the rally, nine-time Bathurst champion Peter Brock at the wheel with a V8 Holden Ute. Holden, very keen to sort of promote the Ute, and to try and, you know, present it as a, as a vehicle that is very different from any utes that people might have seen. It doesn't ride nor handle anything like the uh, previous model Holden utes. And uh, so they said, Brocky, why don't you get out there and sort of have a bit of a go and uh, show people what it can do. The Temco Prologue is the first competitive stage of the event. She's as calm as anything. I mean, I'm the one that's all nerves. A five-kilometre street sprint. It's Targa's version of race qualifying. The quickest here has the honour of starting at the back of the pack. I don't think we've ever done this stage in the wet before. We can lose the event here, not win it. setting the fastest time in his brand new Porsche 911 Turbo. Four-time winners of the event, Richards and Navigator Barry Oliver, perfectly placed to extend their run.
Bosch filling eight spots in the top ten. Max Morick second with Peter Fitzgerald third, nine seconds behind Richards. At the other end of the scale, come 15, the 1926 Vauxhall, piloted by Scott Hipkins, one of the Shannon's historic field, completing the qualifying stage in a leisurely 6 minutes and 39 seconds, the slowest of the 255 car field. But it's got a lot of torque. The flag car for the 2001 event, a Bugatti Type 35B, driven by Nick Cox and Stephen Fong, one of three Bugattis battling the roads of Tasmania. This particular car um, is a 1926 Bugatti. It was brought into Australia about 1927, I think. Um, it ran in the 1936 Australian Centenary Grand Prix at Victor Harbour in South Australia. The present owners uh, bought it in 1992. Um, did some restoration work to it and um, it had its first outing in Australia in the 1992 Australian Grand Prix as a support race for Bugattis and old cars. And since then it's done um, the Mille Migler in in France, a um, few events overseas. It's been to America for a few um, sort of Bugatti rallies and things like that. It came to Targa in 1993, and well, it's back again now in 2001. The quickest of the historics, Max Lane's 1931 Bugatti Type 51. Fastest qualifier in the muscle bound classic competition. Brian Tarrant, 79 Mazda RX-7. Mick Dewan's first tentative run at pace, placing the big Mercedes in 53rd. Mark was yelling at me to go a bit quicker, but I had to calm him down a little bit. Cool and calm, just stay in the office, normal job. Just good to get through it, really. It's a shame that uh, the weather wasn't the, the best of conditions for us. It's wet and slippery, you can see that. And, uh, but well, look, there's really no need to do anything silly here. We just really wanted to make sure that we got through this section without uh, hitting any curbs or doing anything silly. So uh, we really just, just drove through it and made sure that uh, we're there tomorrow. Peter Brock with son James navigating, placing the Ute 37th fastest in the modern competition. How'd you go, Pete? Good. Yeah. Oh. Hey, was that you that knocked all those hobails out of there? Oh, thanks very much. I'm claiming it was... Peter. I'm claiming Barry Sheen, no, no, the no, four-wheel no, no. drive. That was drove straight through the middle, took a shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for once in a way, it wasn't me. Was hey, it wasn't slippery there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like a chop. Really? So it went all right? Yes, very good. It's quite well behaved. I mean, brakes good and turned in good, got the power down quite well. It doesn't wheel spin. Well, it was getting a bit of wheel spin, but it was sort of like the diff wasn't sort of locking up properly. Yeah. Was, but it was getting good traction, basically. I mean, don't you reckon, James? Yeah. Is this right thing like ABS? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And Naturally, you... it's a whole mess. Oh, here we go. It's what are you talking about? about? Holden commercial, isn't it? It is. It's shocking. Two-time motorcycle world champion Barry Sheen, like Mick Doohan, also having his first crack at Target Tasmania. year after I gave up bikes, I took over the two hours of factory drive in England to win purses. I raced Group A for a year. Now I raced trucks for three years. His big rig experience, making him the perfect pilot for the second factory Mercedes in the field. The unlikely looking but very quick ML55 AMG four-wheel drive. Day one, the Northern Loop. 338 kilometres with 10 competitive target stages. The leg begins and ends in Launceston, travelling to Devonport and the Tamer Valley. The morning stages are easy, generous base times allowing everyone to work into the groove. morning of Tiger is always an easy morning. Ease everybody into the event. Devonport, that's the first, the first proper stage that really counts in this event. 
While some were finding the going easy, others were not. Always the dark horse, Warwick Fremantle in this 93 Nissan GTR had his hopes dashed on only the second stage of the event. About halfway through, three quarters of the way through Moriarty, uh, it just popped a turbo hose off, so the engine basically stopped. And uh, so we'll uh, tow it into Devonport and fix it up and get going again, hopefully. Adding to the pressure, several base times have been lowered from previous years, making it a lot more difficult for teams to clean stages as they had in the past. Lowered a few base times, that means we don't get any free rides, you know, you could sort of go easy on some of them, but you're going to have to go flat out all the time now. In the past you might have cleaned that stage, but so did everybody else. Maybe if, there'll be a few less cars that clean them. Stage 4 Devonport will sort, you know, the wood from the trees. I won it last year. I don't know whether I win it this year. I've got a new car, I'm still getting used to it. I think Jim Richards will be hard to beat. It's impossible to clean that stage as such and therefore come out without a penalty, so everybody will start dropping time. So what we've got to try and do is lose less time than anyone else. No! Fast left three uphill. 50. Straight crest. Ah. Immediate right five at 100. Settle down. Left five. Out front, Jim Richards was a man on a mission. Car 919, cleaning the Devonport stage. The only car to do so. A demoralising result for those chasing the Turbo 911. He cleaned it by two seconds, Barker. <laughs> so I think that set the measure for the event. It was touch and go whether we thought we would clean it, but we did, so uh, yeah, it's good. He's definitely the one to beat, which we all knew. Glenn Buckpit didn't clean the stage. His Brock Commodore bent right out of shape. Uh, just came into the corner, I think I had something like oil or something on the road, locked up, and got off it, and he wasn't going to come back, so he the skids and the tree. <laughs> The final stages of the day could also cost time. After a gentle start, it was time to pin back the ears. Dewan was finding his feet. After starting in 53rd, the CLK Mercedes was working its way up through the field at day's end, running 17th. It feels a lot better in the dry, that's for sure. We're starting to get more feel for the car and, uh, and, try, and try and get as close to the stage times as we can, if not under them. Car 05, the Ute with Peter Brock behind the wheel, also on the charge. Holden's working class hero rubbing shoulders with the supercars inside the top 10. We've got a small work list to do tonight, but uh, basically the car is going uh, fantastically well. The event's first ute was turning heads and setting fast times. Well, you might think this is a giant tortoise down here, but it's not. It's not an endangered species. This is a 5.7 litre aluminium V8, and uh, we thought on it a uh, heavy-duty airbox, which allows a little bit more on the inlet side of things. Bit of a HSV trick, you know. Uh, got a nice exhaust system. 
which again gives it a bit of a note. I'd like a bit more throb actually, but it's not bad, it's quite, quite nice. The V8's actually not very heavy. People think, oh, it's going to be a big heavy engine. It's actually only four kilograms heavier than a V6. So um, it steers very, not, very nicely. Jim Richards found himself in a familiar position at the top of the modern leaderboard, dropping just 27 seconds for the day. Peter Fitzgerald next, 26 seconds further back, with Tony Quinn's Porsche third a further four seconds behind. Andrew Medecki's V10 Viper, the first non-Porsche in fourth. Ray Lintott's 911 rounding out the top five. Porsche was also doing well in the classic competition. Paul Stewart's 74 Carrera, three seconds ahead of Patrick Mewing's Lotus Alam, with the Datsun 240Z of Graham Copeland third. I think we just got a shoulder on and be there at the end. It's only day one. Making his return to Targa for the first time since winning in 1994, Andrew Medecki was again making his presence felt. At the wheel of the imposing 8-litre V10 Dodge Viper, Medecki and co-driver Ron Cohen were running fourth and confident of challenging for the lead if the road stayed dry. Well, it is a beast, but it's, it's in fact a fairly clever motor car. It has a v, an 8-litre V10 engine, which is all aluminium. It actually started off light as, uh, life as a, as a uh, truck engine in the States. Well, it has 500 horsepower, 500 genuine horsepower, not, not ponies. Well over 500 foot-pound of torque, and that's a lot of a lot of torque. And that means that whatever gear you're in, you put your foot down, you're going places in a hurry. Three thirty, three forty, I reckon. Good. That's if you're brave enough to hang on. Or. The competition route for day two: a total of 385 kilometres and eight target stages. An early morning run through the mountainous northeast, then a circuit sprint at the Simmons Plains Raceway. The day culminating on the streets of historic Longford. A highlight day for spectators and competitors alike. One, go. Flat right. The flat left. Change the times um, or the base times a little bit, which is great because um, now we can't clean any of the, these stages today, and uh, so everyone loses time. Uh, and that's good because if you happen to do a faster time than the next bloke, then you gain time on them. Your medium flat left, your medium right, okay, flat left, Special stage one, the sidling, 13.8 kilometres of winding blacktop, a Targa driver's dream. Flat right, to flat left, medium right, to medium left, to hard right, to flat left, flat right, to flat left, long corner, medium right, flat right, to flat left, Okay, so hard left there, hard right, to flat left, medium right. Medium right, that's the medium right, that's a little bit to a hard left. Look at this, look at the hard left coming up. So medium right, hard left. Flat left. Flat left. For Mick Doohan, the sidling was a chance to claim his first trophy scalp. The silver Mercedes, faster through the stage than Brocky's Ute. Quicker than the old master. Tell us about that run. Yeah, I think the, uh, the hay bale come loose in the back of the Ute. Exactly. <laughs> I, I look, honestly, I'm, I'm past it. That's it. I shoot all over. But, uh, no, that was a fun event and uh, just starting to get the feel for the, for the Mercedes. And we started to go over and unfortunately Peter had a few problems and we capitalised on that but uh, you know we've still got a, quite a few days to go so. Now the reality is that I reckon Mick has done a fantastic job. I mean my car was suffering problems but 
you know, you know, you've got a fair idea how much it's costing you. And for Mick to be doing the times he's doing means he's really on pace and, uh, you know, surprising a few people, Mick. The Ute was having diff problems that was costing Brock time and dropping him out of the top ten. I was in two minds about whether to fix the diff up because it's perfectly reliable, but I thought, oh, it's gone pretty good. And I heard that, I thought, James, get that diff. We need that diff. If Mick Doohan's beaten me, we're going to have a go. No problems for Mick Doohan on Pai and Gana. The Silver Ben setting the third quickest time, only six seconds slower than Richard's. Sort of got the taste for it a little bit yesterday, and uh, we feel a lot better today. Things not quite as cheerful in the Peter Fitzgerald camp. The second-placed car, 811, blowing its drive line. Coming down Welborough on the way down the hill, we got past the hairpin, and then I plucked third, and there was no drive. So I've rolled all the way out across the finish line. So we should at least get a time at Welborough. <laughs> the surprise move on day two, coming from unheralded Tasmanian duo, Jason and John White. Jason White behind us is going very quickly. The 1990 Nissan 300ZX, consistently the second fastest car on the road. The pair jumping three places up the order to grab fourth. In this type of car, I'm sure it's um, upsetting quite a few people, but uh, that's what we're here for. We like to, we like to stir them up, so uh, we have to try pretty hard, though, to, to get where we are. So, no, it's good fun, though. to be driven with a bit of attitude. This is an old English Group 4 rally car. New Zealander John Kershaw was lighting it up in his 79 Vauxhall Chevette. <laughs> Slow corners, it needs a flick to get it to turn in nicely. That's how I like to drive. South France. We flipped and rolled, and it's just caught us in the hedge before we go down into the pond. That was very lucky, that was. Very lucky. <laughs> That's a scrapper now. That's a salvage the parts you can out of it, really. No, we'll go on holiday and stay somewhere nice and warm and go up to, uh, go up to uh, where's it called? I think we're going to Port Douglas. We're going to go up to Port Douglas, I think, and uh, go and lie in the sunshine. <laughs> Brett Duquette's 64 Ford Falcon, also the victim of some over-ambitious pedalling. Barry Sheen, another finding the rough in the Mercedes. Came down into a hairpin and he hit a bump and he just kept bouncing. And he bounced, bounced, bounced on the front and it just shot and it just touched the bank. And it touched the bank, what it's done is knocked the, the wheel in at the bottom, so it sort of altered the, what you call the camber, which just really aggravates me. It's uh, like driving a block of apartments, really. Aside from a little bit more understeer and some cosmetic blemishes, the ML55 soldiering on in true off-road style. So we really wanted to get some manufacturers back into the event. Along with the high-profile factory-backed entries from Mercedes, Porsche and Holden, the 2001 Target Tasmania Rally attracted corporate efforts from Ford, Toyota, Mazda and Lexus. In total, seven manufacturers' teams. This is very special, this place. You can uh, test the cars wherever you like. 
hot conditions or whatever, but you can't get the concentration of tight corners and grip like you can get here in Targa over those sort of gorge stages you get things like that. Returning to the rally after a three-year absence, entering two 2000 MX-5s, including a new turbo prototype, with ex-rally champ Murray Coote behind the wheel. Making its debut in the rally, Ford has entered a Falcon XR6, driven by Ford racing engineer Steve Hoynville. Targa the ideal opportunity to promote the XR6's potential as a recreational race car. pushing it as hard as we possibly can. Realistically, a top five is an excellent result for us, and that's what we're aiming for. Giving away plenty of horsepower to the leading Porsches, the afternoon stages of day two would be hard work for the Lexus team. I don't think even with that flash for this afternoon, we've got Elephant Pass, which is all uphill. And then Simmons, which uh, it's got long straights, so those expensive Volkswagen things will go quick around there. Afternoon, day two, and the field passes through Tasmania's motorsport heartland. The Simmons Plains Raceway, still the state's premier circuit, and the street stage of Longford, home to the Australian Grand Prix in the 60s. put on a show. But yes dear, yes dear. There's a wonder there's not more husband and wife teams in rallying because it'd be the only time you'd win and you do what your missus told you, wouldn't you? <laughs> At the end of day two, Nick Cox in the number one Bugatti Type 35 held a comfortable lead in the Shannon's historic competition. Max Lane in another Bugatti second, with John and Paul Lawson's 38 Alpha in third. At the top of the Touring Classic, Philip Nichols in an Austin Healey Sprite was leading from Brian Tithridge's Jaguar XK140. Darren Meyer in an EH Holden third. In the classic competition, the Datsun 240Z of Graham Copeland and John Siddons held a nine-second advantage over Rex Broadbent's Porsche 911, with another Porsche 911 driven by Paul Stewart, third, 25 seconds off the lead. Andrew McDickey had pushed the Dodge Viper into the top three in the modern competition for the first time in the rally. Porsche pilot Tony Quinn had jumped into second place, but now more than a minute behind Jim Richards. Richards and Oliver had cleaned the final two stages and had been quickest on all the rest. The pair were well in contention for their fifth target Tasmania title. Jim Richards revelling in his new Porsche 911 Turbo. Well, this car's probably got about 310 kilowatts. Um, it's a flat six. It's water-cooled now instead of air-cooled. It has um, twin-overed camshaft, four-valve per cylinder. 
Uh, you can't see much there, obviously, because all the, the, the power plant is underneath that. Um, it revs to about 6,600 RPM, has a cutout. Uh, that's the air cleaner, all the air for the engine coming through this hole, into the air cleaner, into the engine. It has twin turbochargers, four-wheel drive, six-speed gearbox, big brakes, and uh, they go very, very well. Uh, I think it would do 320k. Yeah, so it's pretty good for taking to the shop again. We, we have the air conditioning running on the car throughout the event because this little module here actually cools the fuel going into the engine. And uh, if we had the air conditioning off, the fuel would be hotter, the engine would probably lose 10 or 15 horsepower. So we have the, the air on all the time, the fuel gets cold, cooler, it makes the motor produce good power. It's all about boys. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> While the high profile drivers in the modern competition are mobbed at every stop, <laughs> most of the competitors attract considerably less attention. Classic competition leaders Graham Copeland and John Siddons having the ride of a lifetime. Brian Garner, he had the greatest ride. You know, I just said, we got the finish line. I said, forget the time, let's go back to start and do that again. What a hoot. And even sharing the driving duties. Yeah, we're both bad navigators, so we have a drive. The support crew getting in on the action. Pink dots adorning the dash with every stage successfully completed. Well, you guys saw the pink door last year. Well, there's a crew running around here somewhere, putting them on at night when we disappear. Come back, all the stages we make, they tick. So it's going to look awful by the end of the bloody event. <laughs> Another classic team quietly going about their business, Victorians Len and Gail Catlin. Their 67 Mustang, one of the real hot rods of the classic field. The car's a 67 Mustang, and that's what the shell is. It's all original. It was a two owner out of America. One bloke had it for 15 years, another one for 17 years. So we got a hold of the car and we wrecked it. <laughs> Simple as that. We put a, a 302 in it, a six speed sequential Hollinger gearbox. Um, it's got a very similar setup to a uh, Group A rear end in it. Um, and all the normal things you put in a car to make it safe. Uh, proper fuel cell, uh, good brakes, all, all the things you should have in a car that's quite, it's quite smart in performance. 150 straight on. Fast left three. 200. Leave two on the left. That's uh, one. I leave this one and then fast left three. 150. Fast left three. Immediate right three. 250. Medium right three. 150. Straight on at the crossroads. Watch the jump. And 80, and fast left three at the phone box. 300. I just love playing with the stick. <laughs> that is really sensational. You just, you change gears for the sake you wanted to change a gear. <laughs> Day three takes the field west from Launceston to Burnie, a total distance of 358 kilometres. Along the way, 10 competitive stages, including the second longest of the event, the 38 kilometre Sathana stage. Another feature of day three, Natone, a stretch of road that has bent more Tiger cars than any other. Yeah.
Saga's unique attractions is its diversity. Pre-war Grand Prix cars, the Nibble Minis, 60s muscle cars and state-of-the-art entries from the world's premier marks. A contrasting spectacle seen nowhere else on earth. The evolution of the motor car through the ages, on show on the same roads, the same day, with the same goal. If Target Tasmania has a catch cry, it is to drive them as they were intended. The 2000 Daytona Coupe, one of the most technically unique cars entered in the rally. Based on the Daytonas that had raced at Le Mans in the 60s, driver Richard Bendel had set about building a modern version of the car and was using Targa as its first test. While Natone has the reputation, it was the Deloraine stage that saw the first major incident of the event. The Nissan GTR, with Gary Burchett and navigator Rod Markin on board, perched in a tree after a frightening high speed off. The driver sustained leg injuries and was lucky to escape further harm after a tree fell on the rescue scene. A couple of stages down the road and more trouble. This time, Targa veteran Jack Waldron had made a rare mistake. His Fiat Arbath down, but not out. So providing there's no damage to the uh, cooling system underneath, we'll be back into it. The same corner, catching out Lance Jones in a BMW 2002. Also out of the running, the third-placed Dodge Viper, driven by Andrew Merdecki. The car had damaged an engine balance shaft and could not be easily repaired. The thunderous charge of the V10 ending with a whimper. The Vipers exit elevated local hero Jason White into the top three for the first time. We're third, yeah, we're quite happy with that. We just got the news. The former Australian go-kart champion wringing the neck of his 11-year-old Nissan to stay on the pace. Everything's running smooth, so hopefully Sathana being a long stage, we might even be able to pick up a bit on, on Quinn. So he's our, he's our aim. We want to try and take him today and try and steal that second spot. Mick Dewan's morning progress was being slowed, or rather, not slowed by a lack of brakes. Well, this morning the brakes haven't been fantastic, but uh, they've been good enough. We, we, we got through all those sections this morning or stages, um, no problem. But, but yeah, we'd like to get it back to something like we had yesterday. We've got uh, some important ones coming up this afternoon, so we don't really want to sacrifice any time. Jim Richards was still the quickest man on the road, but he too was now facing a dilemma. His four-wheel drive 911 Turbo, by poor standards, is a heavy car. The dry roads, combined with his fast tyres, were taking a toll on the car's precious tyres. Each team gets only four tyres to complete the rally. To change one incurs a one-minute time penalty. At lunch on day three, Jim Richards was fast running out of rubber. Medium left. The later stages of day three again raise the bar, nearly 93 kilometres of rallying. Sathana, Wilmot, Guns Plains and the infamous South Rayana and Natone. Stages are longer, harder and demand more attention. Some crews made the leap, others did not. Oh, just going a little bit too fast. <laughs> Trying a little bit too hard. Started to get a bit squirmy, I should have slowed down, and I crashed. 
<laughs> Just lost it. Oh my god, that is easy. Biggest news of the day, captured by the onboard camera in Jim Richards' Porsche. Seven kilometres into the Sathana stage, on its roof, billowing smoke, lay the $250,000 Mercedes CLK 55. Michael Dewan is out of Targa, the motorcycle world champ crashing out on the third day of the event. One of the left handers there and I just ran in a little bit too quick and uh, it started pushing the front and um, with... With my experience, I couldn't get it back to, uh, to uh, stay on the road, but uh, there was a big rock sticking out of the embankment, and uh, the front took a liking to that, or the front wheel took a liking to that, and just spun us off up in the air and over, and uh, it was just one of those things, uh, made a mistake, put it on its ear, and uh, the race is over. from strength to strength, Nick Cox and Stephen Fong. Their lead extended to more than eight minutes at the head of the historic competition. Second, Max Lane's Type 51 Bugatti, with John Lawson driving the 38 Alfa Romeo third. Movement at the top of the Touring Classic field, with Brian Tetheridge taking the lead in his Jaguar XK140. Philip Nichols and the 58 Sprite relegated to second. Just eight seconds were separating the top two. Darren Meyer holding station in the E.H. Holden in third. Day three had been good to Rex Broadbent. His Porsche catapulted into the lead of the classic competition after day two leader Graham Copeland had a minor off on the Sathana stage. In second place, the Porsche of Paul Stewart. Tasmanians Jeff and Leon Duggan up two places and Danson running third. Peter Brock had also climbed two places. The Ute up to 14th in the modern field. The final four stages of the day revealed a new player in the modern competition. Craig Dean, in a Toyota Supra, had been second fastest for the afternoon and actually beat Jim Richards on the Natom stage by six seconds. Jim Richards continued to lead, but only by 15 seconds. His Porsche's rear tyres had thrown in the towel and had to be replaced. You don't get the extra performance that we're getting out of the, of the car on the roads without something, uh, taking away something, and that's rubber. And uh, so we had to put two new tyres on. Tony Quinn now trailed Richards by 15 seconds. I can win. No problem. <laughs> if you, if everybody else leaves the field, I'm a sure winner. <laughs> Quinn now had a realistic shot at the outright lead. The hard-charging Jason White, also within reach of Richards, heading into his favourite leg of the event. If we've been going well so far, we should go even better tomorrow, so hopefully pull a gap on the people that we've um, already caught so far. For the first time in recent Targa memory, Jim Richards was under the pump. Day four takes the field from Burnie down Tasmania's west coast to Hobart. The longest day of the event, a total of 509 kilometres with nine target stages. Of all the days, this was the most important, the greatest opportunity to gain or lose time.
all but ended on the third stage of the day. The ute boiling its power steering fluid. When you go through a lot of switchback roads, and I guess at racing speeds, you are using the power steering enormously, and it boiled the fluid in the power steering, which caused the pump to fail. And it felt like my V8 supercar to drive. Hang on, feels like 05, hey. Renowned for its wet and wild weather, day four found the west coast on its best behaviour, fine and dry. Good news for some, not so good for others. Dry roads are hard on tyres, and at the front of the modern competition, Jim Richards' Porsche was showing an unhealthy appetite for rubber. But with a lead of just 15 seconds, Richards had no option but to press on. The hard right. The hard right. Behind Richards, Queenslander Tony Quinn was also charging hard, dropping only 25 seconds on the morning stages. A good result, but still not fast enough to match Richards. Car 919 losing just five seconds on the first four stages. The overall lead extended to 30. Quinn had also lost ground to local hopes Jason and John White, their Nissan the only car to clean the Mount Black stage, and closing the gap between second and third by five seconds. I don't think we've lost too much time. Uh, we haven't made any mistakes. Um, everything's just running according to plan. Victorian Craig Dean was right on the pace with the top three until he lost 53 seconds to third placed White on the Strawn stage. Well, that six right wasn't a six right tightening in my book. <laughs> we come around a bit hot and we just sort of crept onto the gravel and by the time the four wheels got onto the gravel it was uh, a bit hard to handle so the back of the car's sitting down like on the back of a cliff and the front's up on the road nearly. That put the Lexus of rally champions Neil Bates and Coral Taylor in sight of a podium finish, but they too were almost casualties on the Rosebury stage. The Mount Arrowsmith stage is the longest of the event, almost 50 kilometres through the Nelson Valley and Victoria Pass. Through the marathon stage, concentration needs to be at a maximum. On the long straights, top speeds approach the 300 km per hour mark. And with the faster cars catching the slower ones, passing manoeuvres can be hot in the mouth stuff. Richards, Quinn and Dean, the only cars to clean the 47 kilometre stage in under 21 minutes 30 seconds. 
After three days on the limit, Jason White dropped out of podium contention with a narrow escape on Queenstown. The back end of the car just sort of slid out and we, we caught a couple of big guide posts with, um, with a big wise drop going through them. But lucky they were there because there was quite a substantial drop over the other side, so it could have been a hell of a ride down. The hopes of Targa victory gone, Craig Dean Supra taking over outright third place in the modern race. The classic competition was shaping as a battle between two Porsches. At the end of day four, Rex Broadbent's 911 RSR had a lead of 57 seconds ahead of Paul Stewart's 911 Carrera. We've gained only 10 or 12 seconds, so you can see how close it is. I think uh, this event's one of endurance. Uh, you've got to uh, pace yourself through the whole event, try and stay reasonably quick, without uh, overstretching both your own abilities and your car's abilities. In the Touring Classic race, Philip Nichols had retaken the lead, his Sprite holding a 50-second advantage after catching and passing Brian Tithridge's Jaguar, while car number one, the Bugatti Type 35, driven by Nick Cox, held a commanding six-minute lead in the Shannon's historic competition. Max Lane in a Type 51 Bugatti running second. John Lawson's Alpha third. With day five a rest day for the historics, something drastic would have to happen to change the top three. Jim Richards stretching his slim 15 second overnight lead out to a more comfortable 54 by day's end. One of the drives of the day had come from Brian Leroy and Colin Palmer in a 2000 Chevy Corvette hardtop. The pair third quickest overall for the day. The Corvette up from ninth to sixth in the modern competition. After four dry days, day five dawned overcast and wet. Tires that had completed more than 80% of the competitive race distance in the dry would now be asked to do the job in the wet. Day five sweeps from Hobart up the east coast then back to the capital. Nine stages over a total distance of 356 kilometers. Along the way, two new stages for the 2001 event the tight, twisty coastal run of Rocky Hills and the open flowing Lake Leak. Targa has a new leader in the modern competition, Queenslander Tony Quinn. The onset of rain had caused a sensation. Modern leader Jim Richards forced to replace yet another tyre before the start of competition. The move cost him a minute time penalty and the lead. We had to take another tyre after the, uh, the West Coast run, um, so that took another minute off our, off our lead, obviously. Tony Quinn and the Pet Food Porsche thrust into the lead for the first time in the race. For the first four stages of the day, Quinn and Richards went toe-to-toe, -to -toe, both cars cleaning Hobart, Richmond, Runnymede and Triabana. Quinn holding on grimly to his four-second lead before fate stepped in. And I started off really hot and um, we hit a curb and blistered a tyre. The tyre had to be replaced. The resultant time penalty put Jim Richards back in command. Meanwhile, the rest of the field were content with just staying on the black stuff. After an extended dry spell, the rain had made the roads as slippery as ice. When you're out there, you're just thinking, oh my God, like it's so slippery. You feel like you're going so slow, but obviously everyone else is as well. The Daytona 2000 Coupe had come unstuck on the final stage of the day, Grass Tree Hill. Stepped out on the white line, I'll turn I think, around. and. Um, just as a passenger after that. 
and it's um, not much you can do once you lose lose traction. Uh, we um, went for a ride, and this is where we ended up. None of us got hurt, so we tomorrow, next year's another another year. We'll be back. Probably the uh, most treacherous roads I've ever driven on. It's, uh, it was so slippery today, it was hard to get you know, steer or drive. Craig Dean, while going cautiously, was hanging on to third place in the modern competition. But Neil Bates was closing the gap. It was down to only 45 seconds. It's just uh, sort of on the knife edge, so we're going to still get to the finish, but I can assure you we pushed it very, very hard today. We were second fastest overall today to Jim. We took a little bit of time off Craig Dean and off uh, Tony Quinn, and we're going to be very happy with that. Right here. Richards and Oliver back out to a lead of more than one and a half minutes. A noted wet weather specialist, Richards had again covered the roads quicker than anyone else. Good drive. Classic leader Rex Broadbent's hopes were washed away on day five. Diff problems ending his chance of a maiden win. Taking over at the top of the classic field, Paul Stewart in a 1974-911 Carrera. Second in Classic, Jeff and Leon Duggan driving a Datsun Sports. The Austin Healy of Victorian husband and wife team Paul and Christine Freestone up to third. The final day of the event, and also the shortest. 208 kilometres on a return loop out of Hobart, encompassing the spectacular Huon Valley. Ahead, the final eight competitive stages of Target 2001. Day's end holds the promise of rest, and for a select few, the chance of tasting victory. Six started with a blast up Mount Nelson on the outskirts of Hobart. All the leaders getting away to a trouble free start. Stage two, Howden, and Robert Van Wiegen found himself a victim of the slippery conditions, but was determined to get the beautiful Bristol 400 back on the track. Open. first drama unfolded 4.7 kilometers into the Howden stage. Car 436, the escort driven by Tony Esplin, found its way onto the beach. Just about uh, 80 kilometers now out of third gear, just uh, poking away around the corner and it was just so slippery. I think there must have been a little oil on the road. Um, just nothing we could do, so we just braced ourselves and uh, held on and rode it to the end. Straight over the bank and down, it wasn't too bad going, hitting the trees, but when we hit this rock at the bottom, um, it uh, staked in all the front of the car and that's where the, the real impact came but fortunately the uh, trees had slowed down our momentum down the hill so um, yeah, it wasn't too bad but uh, I think the car's seen better days and we'll need uh, a little bit of panel work for next year. The stage downgraded to touring as a result of the incident. Nick Cox and Stephen Fong had an unassailable lead in the number one Bugatti. Barring mechanical failure or driver error, the Type 35 was going like a winner. Max Lane was in second place in his Bugatti, pushing on to the end, actually gaining 23 seconds on the Oyster Cove stage. John and Paul Lawson maintaining third in the Alpha. Positions unchanged in the race to the finish in the Touring Classic competition. Philip Nichols in the Sprite holding out Brian Tithridge's Jaguar. Well back but still maintaining third, Darren Meyer's E.H. Holden. In the Classic competition, Ian Morris and Kate Cribb, who started the day in fifth, had been charging hard. The Alfa Romeo GTV6 up to fourth. Into a nine left, 100.
left and then a ten. This is the eight left, a ten right with a dip, a crest straight on with a dip, a ten left on an air crest 150, a seven left tightens. It's down here, seven left tightens. Put the window down slightly on my side. Seven left tightens and a long ten right becomes an eight right at the shed. Christine Freestar in the Austin Healy dropped 57 seconds on the Oyster Cove stage, elevating Morris and Cribb to third. The second place team of Jeff and Leon Duggan making up 18 seconds on overnight leader Paul Stewart through the early stages and trailed by just over a minute. Flat red. I can't see. Flat right. The wet conditions were playing into the hands of modern leader Jim Richards. The rainmaster dropping only 50 seconds on Oyster Cove and Woodbridge, despite the greasy conditions. Well, the stages aren't that slippery really, but we're just sort of cruising. On the same stages, Tony Quinn dropped almost 1 minute 30. It now seemed he was content with second. I'm happy to be second. I'm delighted. I'm happy to be the second man to Jim Richards. Craig Dean was holding on in third. The Supra and the fourth-placed Lexus of Neil Bates covering the Oyster Cove and Woodbridge stages in exactly the same time. Both crews dropping 1 minute 23. Gerald's outright hopes were dashed on day two when his car's clutch failed. With the car repaired, the 1999 modern winner was back on the pace, the second fastest car on the road. At the moment, we're just taking it to get it home. I don't want to go stick his car in the wall on a miserable day like today. Uh, and our tyres are the ones we started on, so they're starting to lose a little bit of grip in the front end. On the very next stage, his targa went from bad to awful. surprising thing is I didn't really think I was carrying a lot of speed into that turn and, and I turned it in and it just wouldn't turn in. Just didn't respond to the steering effort. Um, turned it like this way, just sort of tops off our whole target, I guess. The final four stages of the day separated crews from the finish line. All stages that could make or break your target efforts. and GTR of Ken Jaffe had been scorching the final stages. Driving right on the edge, he was fastest through the Signet and Longley stages. Jaffe's white knuckle ride ended on the Ridgeway Park stage. Rest point marked the finish line to the 10th target Tasmania. Home safe, Nick Cox and Stephen Fong. Dominance start to finish and victory in the historic competition. Ten minutes ahead of Max Lade in another Bugatti. Defending champion John Lawson third.
In a seesawing battle for touring classic honours, Philip Nichols and Philip Blake in the Sprite had won out over Brian Titheridge's XK140. Darren Meyer's consistent run in the EH Holden rewarded with third. Consistency had also been the key for classic winner Paul Stewart. Challenges had come and gone. Stewart remained unfazed. Tasmanians Jeff and Leon Duggan gave the locals something to cheer about. Second in classic, and after a final day charge, Ian Morris and Kate Cribb carried their Alfa Romeo into third. In one of the closest results, Victorian Craig D managed to stave off Neil Bates in the battle for third in the modern competition. Second place went to Tony Quinn, who had driven a near-perfect race, at one stage leading the event. Winners and conquerors for a record fifth time, Jim Richards and Barry Oliver. A commanding display from the team that continues to set the Targa benchmark. It's just the best event that I've ever been in, and the best event I go in each year. On the sixth day, you're glad it's over. On the seventh day, you start planning the next year.